Hello, and welcome once again to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My name is Mike Parker, and I'm the instructor for the class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Links to the class website are available in the show notes for this video. On the website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint slide presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for these sites and the materials on them. If you enjoy this lesson, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And subscribe if you want to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. The two key individuals in this lesson are Jacob, the fifth son of Lehi and younger brother of Nephi. He had been ordained by his brother to minister as a priest and a teacher to the people of Nephi. This is the same Jacob who will write his own book on the small plates of Nephi. The 8th century BC prophet Isaiah also plays a role in Jacob's teachings. We'll discuss Isaiah's life and ministry in the next lesson. The outline of events for this lesson. Jacob preached a sermon over two days to the people of Nephi. In his teachings, he quoted extensively from the writings of Isaiah found on the brass plates. Jacob declared that the message he taught was given to him by an angel. Nephi recorded Jacob's sermon on the small plates of Nephi. On the first day, Jacob used Isaiah 49, 22 through 52, verse 2, and 55, 1 through 2 as supporting scripture to explain God's promises to the Gentiles and to God's covenant people, the resurrection and the judgment, and justice, mercy, and the law. On the second day, Jacob prophesied of Christ and the restoration of Israel, and he taught of God's promises concerning the Gentiles who would come to the Americas in the last days. He assured the people of Nephi that they had been led away from Jerusalem by the Lord, not cast off by him. The setting for this lesson. Jacob's teachings were given in the settlement named for his brother, Nephi. Nephi didn't tell us when this sermon was given, but Jacob explained that its purpose was that ye might know concerning the covenants of the Lord. This may indicate that it was given in connection with a covenant renewal festival, like the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, which takes place in the fall. Day one. Jacob's preamble begins with, having been called of God and ordained after the manner of his holy order, and having been consecrated by my brother Nephi, Jacob was desirous for the welfare of their souls. He spoke to the people concerning things which are and which are to come, using the writings of Isaiah. Nephi had asked him to speak on the words of Isaiah. Since Isaiah's message was about the house of Israel, Jacob told the people of Nephi that Isaiah's words may be likened unto you for ye are of the house of Israel. Jacob thus followed the pattern set by his older brother. Nephi adapted Isaiah's writings and interpreted them with specific application for Lehi's descendants in the Promised Land. We'll see another example of this in a moment. God's Promises to the Gentiles and to God's Covenant People Jacob began and ended the first portion of his sermon by quoting from Isaiah 49. In 2 Nephi 6, verses 6 and 7, Jacob quoted Isaiah 49, verses 22 and 23. Quote, And now these are the words, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders, and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down with, to thee with their faces towards the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, 
and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Jacob interpreted the Isaiah passage he had just quoted. Jacob had seen in vision that the people they left behind in Jerusalem have been slain and carried away captive into Babylon, but the Lord had shown him that they should return again. Next, he said, the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, will manifest himself unto the people of Jerusalem in the flesh, but the people will kill him. Because of this, they will be scattered, but they shall not be suffered to perish because of the prayers of the faithful. When they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, they shall be gathered together again to the lands of their inheritance. The righteous among the Gentiles will be saved. For this cause the prophet Isaiah has written these things, Jacob explained. While the unrighteous Gentiles will serve the covenant people of Zion, a fulfillment of Isaiah 49:23 and 2 Nephi 6, verse 7. The Messiah will set himself again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. He will return in power and great glory to destroy their enemies and they that believe not in him. And they shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel. Jacob then summarized what he had just taught by quoting Isaiah 49 verses 24 through 26. This is in 2 Nephi 6, verses 16 through 18. Quote, For shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. For thus saith the Lord, I will contend with them that contendeth with thee, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob." Unquote. Note that 2 Nephi chapter 6, verse 17 adds the phrase, For the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people, for thus saith the Lord, to Isaiah 49:25. This was an interpretive comment made by Jacob. It does not reflect Isaiah's original text. We know this because Nephi quoted the same verse in 1 Nephi 21, verse 25, without Jacob's addition. Also note that verse 17 switches from the Lord speaking in the first person to a third person description of the acts of the mighty God, and then returns to the Lord's words by repeating, for thus saith the Lord. This kind of interpretive reading of Isaiah was important to Nephi and Jacob. We'll revisit it more in the next lesson. Jacob continued quoting Isaiah's writings from the plates of brass. Jacob quoted the prophetic prophecies from Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1, through chapter 52, verse 2. This lengthy passage prophesied of the mission and suffering of God's Messiah and presented the Lord's message of comfort for Zion and encouragement for her people to awaken. I'll briefly summarize these two chapters and then move to Jacob's commentary about them. Second Nephi chapter seven is a quotation of Isaiah chapter 50. This chapter is about a remorseless nation and a willing servant. The people of Israel have rejected the Lord, but the Lord has been faithful to them and still has power to deliver them. The song of the suffering servant is quoted. The suffering servant is God's Messiah. The Lord has empowered his servant, and the servant is worthy and totally obedient to the Lord. The servant suffers abuse and humiliation. The servant is determined and resolute as he carries out his divine mission. The Lord will vindicate his servant and destroy his servant's enemies. The Lord condemns those who walketh in darkness and hath no light, but trust in their own strength to save them. Second Nephi chapter eight is a quotation of Isaiah 51 verse one through 52 verse two. God will save those who come to him. The Lord's salvation is near. The Lord appealed to the righteous. He shall comfort or console Zion and make her a place of joy and gladness. Deliverance is coming. The Lord would issue everlasting justice 
Therefore the righteous need not fear or be dismayed, for all their enemies would be destroyed. Isaiah called on the arm of the Lord, a symbolic reference to God's power and might, to awake and deliver his people as he did when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. As he once did in Egypt, the Lord would again redeem Zion and her people and would return them to their promised land to dwell forever in joy and holiness, gladness and joy. The Lord told his people not to be afraid of mortal men, for the Lord is more powerful than the heavens and the earth. He will destroy Israel's captors and release the captives from prison. The Lord has put his words in the mouth of his servant and protected him so that the Lord may establish his people, Zion. The people of Israel experienced complete disaster. They had drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Their two sons, the offspring of their disobedience, had been desolation and destruction and famine and sword. The Lord, however, will remove out of thine hand the cup of trembling or intoxication, the dregs of the cup of my fury, and will instead put it, the cup of God's fury, into the hand of them that afflict thee. Earlier in 2 Nephi chapter 8, verse 9, Isaiah had pleaded with God, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Now he pleaded with Israel, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. The armies of the Gentiles will no longer conquer Jerusalem. So Isaiah called on his people to stop acting like slaves who sit in the dust and wear iron chains around their necks. The key to understanding the rest of Jacob's sermon is found in his first statement after he quoted from Isaiah's writings. I have read these things that ye might know concerning the covenants of the Lord that he has covenanted with all the house of Israel. These covenants were given to Israel from the beginning, and they remain in force. Jacob previously said that Isaiah wrote to show that the Lord God will fulfill his covenants, which he has made unto his children. He mentioned covenants several times in the remainder of his sermon. Jacob first gave an overview of God's plan of salvation with a focus on God's salvation from what he called three times that awful monster, death and hell. The opening part of chapter 9 is Jacob's explanation of the mission of the suffering servant of Isaiah 50 and 2 Nephi 7. He first testified of the surety of the resurrection. Our flesh must waste away and die. Nevertheless, in our bodies we shall see God. He next testified that God himself, the great creator, will also be resurrected, for he suffereth himself to become subject unto man in the flesh, and die for all men, that all men might become subject unto him. To understand Jacob's doctrine, it's important to know that God will die for all men, and because God will do this, all human beings will be subject unto him. In other words, all men and women are completely dependent on God's supreme act of self-sacrifice. What would happen if God had not died for all men? Jacob explained, 2 Nephi chapter 9, verses 6 through 10, quote, For as death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator, there must needs be a power of resurrection, and the resurrection must needs come unto man by reason of the fall. And the fall came by reason of transgression. And because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Wherefore, it must needs be an infinite atonement. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs have remained to an endless duration. And if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth, to rise no more. O oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy and grace! For behold, if the flesh should rise no more, our spirits must become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and became the devil to rise no more. And our spirits must have become like unto him. And we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God and to remain with the father of lies in misery 
like unto himself, yea, to that being who beguiled our first parents, who transformeth himself nigh unto an angel of light, and stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder, and all manner of secret works of darkness. O oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body, and also the death of the spirit." Unquote. Jacob taught that death is inevitable and a part of God's plan, brought about by the transgression and fall of our first parents. Therefore, to fulfill the merciful plan of the great creator, there must be a resurrection that overcomes both physical and spiritual death. This atonement wasn't like the ones carried out under the law of Moses. It was an infinite atonement. If it hadn't been infinite, then the first judgment which came upon man, the judgment of Adam and Eve that expelled them from the Garden of Eden, resulting in spiritual and physical death, would have been permanent. If death were permanent and there were no resurrection, none of us could receive salvation in any degree of glory, celestial, terrestrial, or celestial. After we had died, our spirits would be sent to dwell with the devil and his angels for eternity. Everyone would become a son of perdition. Jacob called this horrific possibility an awful monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. This passage contains the first two of seven poetic statements of praise for God in Jacob's sermon that each begin with the exclamation, O, oh. poetic O oh, number one, O oh, the wisdom of God, his mercy and grace. Poetic O oh, number two, O oh, how great the goodness of our God. These statements praise God for saving us from an eternity of physical and spiritual death. Because God has delivered us from spiritual death, hell, and temporal death, the grave, the bodies and the spirits of men will be restored one to the other, and all men will become incorruptible and immortal. They are living souls that have a perfect knowledge. Poetico number three, oh, how great the plan of our God. A perfect knowledge of what? All our guilt and our uncleanness and our nakedness, while the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even with the robe of righteousness. Equipped with this knowledge, we must appear before the judgment seat of the Holy One of Israel to be judged by him. At that point, it will be too late to change what we have chosen to become. They who are righteous shall be righteous still, and they who are filthy shall be filthy still. Those who are filthy are the devil and his angels, and they shall go away into everlasting fire, while the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Poetico number four, O oh, the greatness and the justice of our God. Poetico number five, O oh, the greatness of the mercy of our God, the Holy One of Israel. Note that these two O's mention God's justice and his mercy in connection with the final judgment. These two divine attributes appear together repeatedly in the Book of Mormon. Jacob testified that God has all knowledge and can and will save all men if they will hearken unto his voice. To accomplish this, God would become mortal and suffer the pains of every created being in order to bring about their resurrection. Only those who have perfect faith, repent, are baptized, and endure to the end, will be saved in the kingdom of God. I understand perfect to mean pure, whole, and mature. In other words, faith that has no pretense, deception, or guile. Perfect faith is not the same as knowledge. It is total trust in and reliance on the Lord's ability to save us. Poetic O number six. Oh, how great the holiness of our God. 
Jacob further taught that the atonement of Christ also satisfies the demands of justice for those who never received God's law. Jacob then pronounced ten woes. A woe is an exclamation of lament, grief, or sorrow. It's often used in the scriptures to denounce those who have committed horrible acts by calling for calamities to befall them. In this passage, Jacob called out those who reject God's counsel. Woe number one. Woe to the person who has the law given, yea, that has all the commandments of God, and that transgresseth them, and that wasteth the days of his probation, for awful is his state. These are they who rebel against God and cannot be saved because they refuse to be saved. These individuals ignore God's law because they think they are wise, so they set aside the counsel of God, supposing they know of themselves. Jacob did not condemn learning, but rather those who are learned and who also reject God. To be learned is good, he declared, if they hearken unto the counsels of God. Poetico number seven, O oh, that cunning plan of the evil one. Poetic O number eight, O oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men. The first six O's were expressions of praise for God because of his greatness. These final O's appear at the commencement of the ten woes and are a lament for the power the devil has over human beings and how willingly men give themselves over to his deceptions. Woe number two. Woe to those who have material riches and despise the poor and persecute the meek, for their treasure is their God. Behold, Jacob warned, their treasure shall perish with them. Woe number three. Woe unto the deaf that will not hear, for they shall perish. Woe number four. Woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish also. Woes three and four are directed not to those who cannot see, or who cannot hear, but to those who refuse to see and hear. Some are deaf or blind by birth or by accident. Others are deaf or blind by choice. Woe number five. Woe unto the uncircumcised of heart, for a knowledge of their iniquities shall smite them at the last day. Recall the perfect knowledge Jacob referred to earlier in this chapter that same knowledge of their iniquities will be present at the last day, which is the day of God's judgment. Woe number six. Woe unto the liar, for he shall be thrust down to hell. Do we strive to be honest in all that we do, as we are asked in the Temple Recommend interview questions? Woe number seven. Woe unto the murderer who deliberately killeth, for he shall die. Deliberately is an important word here. The law of Moses distinguished between intentional murder and accidental manslaughter. Those who choose to kill with malice are condemned. Those who kill unintentionally or in self-defense are not. Woe number eight. Woe unto them who commit whoredoms, those who practice sexual immorality, for they shall be thrust down to hell. It's interesting to me that those who lie and those who commit whoredoms are both warned with the same promise of serious punishment. I think this underscores how deeply the Lord feels about honesty and chastity. Woe number nine. Woe unto those that worship idols, for the devil of all devils delighteth in them. Lest we think that this doesn't apply to us today, Elder L. Tom Perry of the Twelve taught that we make idols of celebrities, of lifestyles, of wealth, and yes, sometimes of graven images or objects. Woe number 10. Summarizing the previous nine woes, this is a general woe unto all those who die in their sins, for they shall return to God and behold his face and remain in their sins. The thing to worry about is not the fact that we sin, which we all do. Instead, we should worry about dying in our sins without having repented and followed God, this is about transforming our nature, something we must make a good faith attempt to do in this life.
Jacob exhorted his people to remember. He used the term remember eight times in this section of his sermon. He pleaded with them. Remember the awfulness in transgressing against that holy God, and also the awfulness of yielding to the enticings of that cunning one. Remember, to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. Things that are carnal pertain to the flesh. Give ear to my words, Jacob asked of his people. I know that the words of truth are hard against all uncleanness, but the righteous fear them not, for they love the truth and are not shaken. The Lord's paths are righteousness, and the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And whoso knocketh, to him he will he open. While those who are puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches will not be permitted to enter. If we expect to be saved, we must cast away our dependence on our wisdom, our learning, and our riches. Not those things themselves, but being puffed up by them. And consider ourselves fools before God and come down in the depths of humility. Having fulfilled his responsibility by warning the people of the consequences of sin and transgression, Jacob removed his outer garment and shook it in front of them as a visual symbol that he shook their iniquities from his soul. This symbolically represented shaking the blood, iniquities, of those who heard his message from his clothing. If blood were on his clothes, it would be evidence that he murdered someone. His audience had heard his message, and they were now responsible for their own sins. Jacob could not be accused of having murdered them spiritually through inaction. Jacob took no pleasure in any of this. He was constrained to speak plainly to his people, for if ye were holy, I would speak unto you of holiness. But as ye are not holy, and ye look upon me as a teacher, it must needs be expedient that I teach you the consequences of sin. Jacob quoted Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2, inserting into Isaiah's words his encouragement to come unto the Holy One of Israel and feast upon that which perisheth not. He closed his first day of instruction by reminding the people of Nephi of the Lord's covenants and condescensions, and he promised that on the following day he would tell them how the Lord would preserve their descendants as a righteous branch unto the house of Israel. Day two. The next day, Jacob returned to a theme that Lehi and Nephi had both previously discussed. The descendants of Lehi were a righteous branch in the promised land given to the people of Lehi. Jacob prophesied that many of Lehi's descendants would perish because of unbelief, but God would be merciful unto many, and our children shall be restored. He taught again that Christ, the God of Israel, would be born among the Jews in Jerusalem, but they would crucify him. Second Nephi chapter 10 verse 3 is the first instance of the name title Christ in the Book of Mormon. Jacob said that this name was revealed to him by an angel during the night between the first and second days of his teachings. The English word Christ comes from the Greek noun Christos. The equivalent Hebrew noun is Mashiach, from which we get the English word Messiah. Both words mean anointed one. Jacob may have spoken to his people in Hebrew and used the Hebrew term. Because of their iniquities, Jacob taught, many Jews would be killed and the rest would be scattered. But when the day came that they believed in their God and that that God is Christ, they would be restored to the lands of their inheritance and they would be gathered in from their long dispersion, from the isles of the sea and from the four parts of the earth. The Gentiles would make it possible for them to return. I would suggest that this has been partially fulfilled in the restoration of the Jewish homeland of Israel in the 20th century. It is also being fulfilled in the gathering of many people of the blood of Israel to the Lord's church and gospel. Meanwhile, the land promised to Lehi's descendants would become a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and no Lehite or other non-Gentile kings would rise up and defeat the Gentiles upon this land. Lehi's land of promise is Zion, 
and he that fighteth against Zion shall perish, and the Lord will be the king of Zion. Because of the covenants the Lord has made, the Lord will protect Zion against anyone, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, who tries to destroy it, and will fulfill his promises, which he made unto the children of men. Because of this covenant promise, after the Gentiles would come to Lehi's land of promise, the Lord would afflict the descendants of Lehi by their hand. Nevertheless, I will soften the hearts of the Gentiles, that they shall be like unto a father to them. Wherefore, the Gentiles shall be blessed and numbered among the house of Israel. The Lord will consecrate this land unto the seed of Lehi, and them who shall be numbered among thy seed forever for the land of, of their inheritance. Because the Lord had blessed the small Nephite group with this knowledge of the future, Jacob encouraged them to remember God and lay aside our sins and not hang down our heads, for we are not cast off. He told them that great are the promises of the Lord unto them who are upon the isles of the sea. Just because they were in a land far from Judah and Jerusalem, the Lord had not forgotten them. Jacob's final plea and blessing. Second Nephi chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, quote, Therefore, cheer up your hearts, and remember that ye are free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death, or the way of eternal life. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God, and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. Wherefore, may God raise you from death by the power of the resurrection, and also from everlasting death by the power of the atonement, that ye may be received into the eternal kingdom of God, that ye may praise him through grace divine. Amen. Ye are free to act for yourselves, he taught, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Jacob here reiterated the final teachings of his father Lehi to his brothers, Laman and Lemuel. He encouraged them to reconcile yourselves to the will of God. To reconcile is to call back into union and friendship the affections which have been alienated, to restore to friendship or favor after estrangement. Reconciliation sometimes refers to a husband and wife who have separated, but later decide they want to get back together which is the message of Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1, that Jacob quoted in 2 Nephi chapter 7, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Have I put thee away, or have I cast thee off forever? Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? To whom have I put thee away, or to which of my creditors have I sold you? At the end of his sermon, Jacob returned to the critical importance of Christ's atonement. Remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God, not your own righteousness or strength, that ye are saved. This is one of the most important verses in the Book of Mormon. Note the sequence of events. We must first be reconciled to God, that is to say, accept his covenant on his terms. Then we are saved by his grace. We are not saved by our own good deeds or works. The Lord has laid down alternative conditions under which we can qualify for his redeeming grace. Jacob's concluding blessing to his people was that God might raise them from physical death by the power of the resurrection and from everlasting death by the power of Christ's atonement, that they may be received into the eternal kingdom of God. That's it for this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button to give it a like and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download the notes and slideshow for this lesson. Next week, we'll discuss Nephi's use of Isaiah's writings to show unto his people the truth of the coming of Christ. The reading is 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 27. This will be one of the longer blocks of scripture we'll cover this year, 17 chapters, 
381 verses, and 12,519 words. I encourage you to read as much of it as you can, with a special focus on chapters 11 and 25 through 27. Try to read the Isaiah chapters, 2 Nephi 12 through 24, or at least skim them so you're familiar with their contents. See you in the next lesson.